All right, well, it is 8.30 here in sunny California. Welcome everybody to our webinar on Candor. This is part two. Um, I am Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We did a, a webinar on Candor back in January and it was so well received that we decided that we needed to do more. So um, this will be part two. Next month we'll be pre presenting part three. Um, and so today, what we'll be focusing on it are, you know, understanding the AHRQ Candor Toolkit um, and talking about the gap analysis process and how to do that and who do we have to engage and who are all of the, the, the people um, that, that really need to be involved and the skills that need to be involved. We'll also examine a, a particular experience from Samaritan Health Services and, and we'll talk about the lessons learned and the challenges that everybody can anticipate in, in uh, implementing Candor. And so here you can see that uh, all of the planning committee members and all of the speakers today have no conflicts of interest to disclose. For continuing credit information, um, as always, we're going to be offering continuing education credit through MedStar Health for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. Um, this activity is only available to those who are here today on the live webinar. So if you're watching this, on our YouTube channel, my apologies, we can't offer CE credit for that. If you are a physician, a nurse, or a pharmacist, then you will, if you registered and told us that, that that was your role, you will get an email from MedStar Health within the next few days. Um, and you'll have to log into their Cloud CME um, system in order to receive your CE. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention, if you are a respiratory therapist, in many cases, your, um, your local board will accept nursing credit for that. So you will also, if you registered as a respiratory therapist looking for nursing credit, you'll also get that email from MedStar. We are also offering ACHE credit, um, CPPS and BCPA credit. For those of you who are, um, who are looking for ACHE credit, all you need to do is just log that information into your ACHE account. Um, we will send you a certificate if you are looking for CPPS or BCPA credit. Um, and if you are looking for CPHQ credit, um, NAHQ will document your attendance on their end. We are gonna be using a program today called Slido. Uh, it's, a, it's a great program where we can poll the audience and get some great information from you. So if you have a chance right now, go ahead and log into slido.com using this number, or you can use the uh, QR code that you see here. Um, you'll have another opportunity to log in when we start the polling questions, so no worries if you don't get to it right now. And I'm very excited today to introduce our moderator, uh, Martin Hatley. Marty is the, the co-director of the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety. He's also a member of the board here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and one of our most favorite uh, volunteers. We're always happy to have Marty here. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Marty so he can introduce the rest of our panelists. Thanks, Marty. Uh, you're welcome, Donna. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here too. So it's uh, I've been looking forward to this panel and I know uh, it's going to be a great program uh, that we offer today. As Donna mentioned, this is the second in our series on, on candor. The first one was an overview. This is the middle part of the trilogy. This is really about helping your organization assess its readiness for candor. And then the next one, which will be next month, was really about implementing and sustaining. So uh, Assessment is a huge portion of the, of the readiness um, um, challenge or opportunity. And we've got a great panel today, um, just in order of, of the faces that you see. Uh, my uh, close friend and colleague, Tim McDonald is here. Tim is really the architect of the Cater Toolkit. He did a lot of the uh, research that went into the demonstration projects that produced the, the toolkit. He's probably the most experienced person that I know in terms of helping organizations implement Candor. So Tim, we're just uh, delighted to have you with us again today. Um, Amy? It's, uh, it, it's great to be here, Marty, and also with our other panelists as well, who are pretty amazing in this domain as well. They are, they are. Amy, I just met you, but I know congratulations are in order. You're the uh, head of patient safety at Samaritan Health Services, and I know you just got your doctorate. And, and that involved work in candor. So welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Julie McCoy is um, a PharmD and a JD. 
uh, from uh, uh, Pro the Providence system. She's been working with Tim and with me uh, in the past doing uh, candor um, gap analyses, which we'll talk about today. And um, Julie, it's just great to work with you today and great to see you again. We, have, we haven't crossed paths in a year or so, so that's fantastic. So Next slide, please. Marty, thanks. Yeah, welcome. So this is gonna be our first poll and we just like to get a sense of who you are. You have a sense of who we are. Um, so um, slido.com, it's a very easy thing to use. Open it up on your phone. If you could just um, um, sort of plug in your answers to the question, what is your role in the organization? This is real time polling. So a lot of safety and quality people here today. We have a fair amount from leadership and from risk and legal. So people are able to, and if they have multiple roles, so we're seeing more than 100% because we're, people are, ha are having multiple roles. Okay. We have a good um, sample with a, with a large representation for safety and quality. Okay, let's move forward um, to the next slide. So Tim, we have you know, covered in an earlier event what candor is, but let's just do a quick recap. Why candor, why is it so important and why is it so important um, at, at this point in time in the history of the patient safety movement in this country? Oh, well, thanks, Marty. Yeah, so just going over again, the whole goal of candor is to shatter the wall of silence, Marty, as you know, that Rosemary Gibson speaks about in her book. But the wall of silence extends beyond just the, the wall between us on the care delivery side, patients, families, and the loved ones, it's also within the teams, within each other. And so part of this shattering the wall of silence really involves a major culture change because we know culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and you know, at the next slide, you know, what you're gonna see is, is, is with the goal here is that when things happen, when harm occurs, um, as we'll advance to the next slide, it's just really important to think about this comprehensive approach. And uh, as you can see there, it's principled, it's comprehensive, it's systematic, and it's empathic. And it was, uh, again, developed by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality over the course of the, the grants that began in 2019 and moved on until the Candor Toolkit was released in May of 2016. And as you'll see again with the next slide, there's many domains uh, to candor that are really important to know and understand about. And when you do the readiness assessment, as we're gonna talk about where uh, Amy and Julie are gonna talk about how we go in and we really take the pulse of the organization and see where they are, it is looking at, are they able to identify harm events that require this comprehensive approach and able to activate their system where two things happen, actually three things happen simultaneously. It's kind of like the aviation go team where with number three there, that response and disclosure, it's, it's communication with patients and families, but it also peer support. And, and then with number four, you can see they're also beginning to do your human factors based event review. Marty, I think in COVID-19, it's demonstrated now more than ever the need for this sort of empathic communication that needs to happen. Uh, patients and families have just been horribly affected by uh, COVID-19 and the entire continuum of healthcare from the outpatient area all the way through acute care um, and even into senior living as well. It's just a big deal. And, and we also know burnout it has been huge. The numbers, I think, suggest 85 to 90 percent of members of the clinical team are now experiencing significant burnout. And so having this process in place that can support the team is also super important now more than anything we've ever seen, Marty, in the evolution of healthcare, at least since I've been involved since, you know, beginning my, my journey in healthcare in 1979. Yep. And then, of course, you know, with the event review, learning from it, and then ultimately leading to, are we able to resolve these cases, even though we know in patients and families cases that it's never really fully resolved, but how do we get to that last conversation? So when we do our assessment, these are some of the kind of domains we really want to think about, Marty, as we go forward. Thanks, Tim. And I'm glad you, you brought up the issue of burnout because um, this is the official flow diagram, by the way, from the Candor Toolkit that, um, 
And whenever I look at this, Tim, I, I wonder where the care for the caregiver component is because it's been such an uh, important part of, of not only attracting interest of healthcare systems, but also you know, getting the engagement that we need to get. And I think you've told me it's that little circle of the middle. I mean, that it's a continuous process and care for the caregiver is throughout this flow, flow diagram. Yeah, Marty, and I agree. And in fact, what I've done, Marty, when we do these, and I've done it a lot with Samaritan, is you see where the word disclosure is, we've actually removed the word disclosure and we have communication in there. And that communication, Marty, is intended to reflect the communication to patients and families and loved ones, but also the care for the caregiver. And the circle in the middle is, as you learn more, you share more with patients and families, but also as you learn more, you identify members of the team who may have been affected you know, by these events. So, so yeah, we're constantly making changes and modifying and improving the flow. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tim, for that overview of candor um, and for just kind of the reminder that this is still a living uh, toolkit. And we'll see that as we get into um, how Samaritan um, implemented. Um, so uh, it's a fantastic toolkit. You have the, the link in the slide before, uh, but I think every system that we've worked with has, um, has modified it to some degree or tweaked it or customized it. Yep. Which brings us to you, Amy. So welcome, Amy, again. And uh, will you tell us, can we move to the next slide, Donna? So Amy, when we were prepping, oh, here's the modules. Here's, the, here's uh, one more slide on the Candor Toolkit, just to quickly give you a sense of what's in it. So we gave you the flow chart, but there are a number of modules. It's at hrq.gov Candor. And what we're going to really focus on today is the gap analysis and implementation planning. Um, because it is really important, as we'll get into, the gap analysis tells you, frankly, whether you're ready to this, whether you've done the work that really is going to set you up for success. It will help you uh, evaluate that. So let's move on to the next slide and to Amy. So Amy, when we were chatting, I uh, and getting to know each other a little bit in preparation for this, you mentioned that it was really mission values and vision that drove your, your organization's interest in candor. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, thanks, Marty. Um, we, as a health system, uh, were introduced to Candor through our insurance broker. Um, so that set the stage, I think, for, um, for the acceptance of the program as a, as a means to resolve claims and um, proactively talk to patients. Uh, our, our health system acknowledged that if our insurance broker feels this is important um, and a valid approach, um, then it's, it's something that we, we could embrace. Um, but before we could get there, uh, we really needed to take some time as a health system to reorient. Um, we were in and still are in a transitional state. Uh, we were just approaching a uh, transition of our president and CEO. Um, and our, our new president came on and said, you know, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to talk to our patients proactively, for us to support our clinicians and, and the rest of our team. We need to prioritize, though, aligning our five hospitals, our at the time, 80 clinics, um, and set a path for our mission, vision, and values. So we took about a year um, uh, across the health system to learn these 17 words uh, so that everybody could um, articulate and align with them. And this truly set the stage for us as we were getting ready to um, embark on our candor work. Um, and now as we're looking at high reliability. Amy, um, when we talked before to you, I'm going to just underscore something you mentioned. You mentioned the importance of leadership, and it was new leadership that really um, emphasized this. Can you say a little bit more? About who, why don't you tell us who they are? Who is your new president, <laughs> and why was this so important to him or her? Our new president, yeah, is uh, Doug Boyson. Um, uh, internally, we, we um, joke um, about uh, WWDD, what would Doug do? Uh, because he is, you know, for me at least, a, a, a strong ethical barometer, which I think is ex extraordinarily um, beneficial to us as a health system to have such a, a fantastic leader. Um, we were also in the, the process of transitioning out a lot of 
um, folks who had a more traditional approach um, to resolving um, patient harm events. And so adopt, and we'll get into some of the information that we learned in our gap analysis, um, but I would say we had some folks um, on my team um, and in the health system who chose to um, retire early or, or leave uh, because of the direction we were going uh, with Candor specifically. Um, but some of those, those transitions really set us up to be able to adopt this. I, I don't think that we would have been in a place, I know we wouldn't have uh, been in a place to adopt Candor as a process um, in 2016, 2017, when we, we learned about uh, Candor, we really had to wait and be intentional and in, um, talking to Tim and, and um, we'll talk about some of the findings of um, other, other uh, adoptions as to why we weren't ready. Great. Marty, if, Marty, Marty, if I could, sure. I just want to follow up on Amy said about Doug. You know, they're going to see later on the attendees is the paper you and I wrote about lessons learned uh, it's now up to probably 500 hospitals we've worked with. I have yet to find a leader like Doug in any of those other hundreds of hospitals. He really is an extraordinary servant leader. He attended so much of not just the gap analysis, but even the training uh, about how do we empathically communicate. So I, I just want to highlight again what an extraordinary person he is and, and how valuable it is to have somebody like that at the helm when you're taking this journey. That's fantastic, uh, Tim. And I'm, I'm, uh, Amy, you're lucky to have a CEO like that. But Tim, I would, I would also say that on the, the uh, candor implementations I worked on with you, we, we found extraordinary leadership being just a key ingredient. Yep. Um, pretty much every hospital where it's worked. Yep. Amy, quickly before we move on, what, what did you, when you learned about the gap analysis process, what did you hope to get out of it? I mean, what were kind of your objectives in, in, in getting out of it? getting something out of it? That's a great question. So I, at the time, was actually a clinical risk manager and, and my manager, um, Chi Hui, who's now our, our enterprise risk director, um, both were introduced to Candor at the same time and we were both very new to risk management and had since transitioned into patient safety and risk. And because we were so new in it, we knew this was where we wanted to go. We didn't know how to get there and we didn't know, we thought we were, we had a good handle on the organization and what our needs were, uh, but we wanted that confirmation. We wanted to know what we needed to do as a team um, to engage our leadership, to engage our healthcare team members. Um, so we truly, when we looked at the gap analysis, wanted to know, are we ready? Where are our opportunities? What are our weaknesses? How can we make some changes um, to ensure that we're ready? Fantastic, thanks. Okay, let, let's go on to the next slide. And this is just a, a timeline that you've given us, Amy. Um, I, I know this will be interesting, interest, of interest to some of our participants. Can you walk us through quickly, if you've spoken to it a little bit already, but um, what was the timeline for implementation? I would say we're still in implementation. Uh, so if there's anything I can, um, I can offer to those folks who are considering um, adopting Candor or a CRP is stick with it. Know that this is a long haul um, labor of love. Uh, we learned about it in September of 2017 um, in talking to Doug in, in January is when he, he transitioned to the CEO and president. We knew we weren't ready, but he had it on his radar. We took that time in 20, um, most of 2018 to, to prep for it. And so we actually had Tim um, present by video at the time. It was a novel process uh, for, for Tim to present. Um, I believe it was June 22nd. Um, which was the, the date his granddaughter was born. <laughs> so true, Amy. Absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> he, he took some time away um, from that wonderful uh, occasion to, um, to talk to our executive leadership and, and help them understand what this meant. Um, 
for Samaritan and, and the benefits of it. Um, our executive leadership um, gave us the permission to uh, go to Honor Health to observe training there so that we knew as a team um, what to expect. Uh, that was our first introduction to empathic communication training and Julie was actually there with us. Uh, and then it took us, you know, almost two years to get to the gap analysis process from the time that we were first introduced um, and another seven months, um, six months until we, we did our first candor training. Um, what you don't see after January 20th is the pandemic and everything else that came with it. Uh, so we prioritized actually our care for the caregiver portion of the program. Uh, Chi Hoi, the enterprise risk officer, is, is responsible for that. We put some of the other work on hold, uh, but felt like the care for the caregiver piece had to happen as soon as possible, um, knowing what we, we now know about um, clinician burnout. Okay. So that we're still in the implementation phase uh, right now. Okay. So um, fair enough. Um, and it's interesting um, to hear you say that because I think we're always surprised by how much care for the caregiver pops up as a crucial portion of this. Again, it's not in the flow diagram, but it's, it seems to be just part of the crucial fabric of CANDOR wherever, we're, uh, wherever I've seen it implemented. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, and Amy, really, can you tell us who facilitated, you, you did a gap an analysis in every one of your hospitals. Who facilitated that process? Uh, you're looking at them, Julie and Tim um, facilitated. Uh, we actually did our process a little bit different than some other organizations. We were on the heels of a um, consultant group coming in and optimizing our operations, uh, which was, and, and I'm sure Tim and Julie will talk about this, traumatic for some of our teams. Um, and so we knew that sending folks in to um, interview with another consultant could be triggering, and, and I don't say that lightly. So we had spent um, in that probably July 2015 until that point, building relationships with our, our healthcare team members. That was a big priority for our team. In that time, we had previously been known as the deny, defend, delay group um, that, that really embraced siloing and, and, um, and not sharing information. And so we had spent a lot of time developing relationships and we knew that the teams were having some burnout from, from consultants. Uh, so our team actually participated with Tim and Julie um, encouraging folks to be honest, telling them this was a safe space and really introducing the reason behind why Julie and Tim were there. Okay, great. <clears throat> and so Julie and Tim facilitated, but your team attended some of the facilitated sessions. Is that correct? We attended all of them. Okay, so you were listening in as it was happening. Okay, yes. good. And this slide is just a sort of a quick peek at what's in the, the Gap Analysis Facilitators Guide, which is one of the HRQ tools. And um, it's got you know, several different um, resources that it draws on in terms of structuring the, the Gap Analysis. Tim, I don't know if you want to say anything or Julie, want to say anything quickly about this before we move on to the next slide? Well, while we really did build out the questions, Marty, based on the NQFSA practices, you know, related to you know, one, two, uh, four, five, seven, and eight, which are the ones you see there, the leadership, the culture, identification, mitigation, risks, and hazards, all the questions that go into that really do emanate from NQF and how you go about and assessing the organization to do that. And then we also ask questions around the high reliability domains of culture, you know, performance improvement and leadership. And that's how we built out the guide. And then we'll talk later about how it then flows to the creation of the report that goes to leadership. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So, Julie, I haven't really um, uh, invited you into this conversation as much yet, but can you just say a little bit about the approach? As one of the facilitators, how did you just approach doing um, these interviews with the different stakeholder audiences in the organization? Sure, thanks, Marty. Um, as Marty mentioned, just 
My name is Julie McCoy, and I'm a practicing pharmacy manager and an attorney, and my focus is in health law. Um, I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time in September of 2019, like Amy mentioned on their timeline. Um, Tim was getting ready to do this gap analysis with Samaritan, and he had to be uh, in person for a keynote speech on the day, on one of the days of the gap analysis. So he asked me to come and take his place that day. And so it was just a significant learning experience for me. And um, I'm thankful for that. And so I was this neutral person coming in and um, thrilled to have Amy and her team present for the sessions. And they, they just soaked it up and really, really listened. They never once try to defend someone's statement uh, when we ask a lot of questions, a lot of questions and um, try to take those AHRQ tools and modify them to meet the needs of this analysis. So it was not a, um, it was not a quick and rapid fire checklist of questions to mark the box, non-compliant, partially compliant, fully compliant, but rather it was to, to really get to the cultural readiness for candor. And that happened through these open conversations with facilitated groups. Um, so we asked the questions um, that we modified from AHRQ tools, like Tim mentioned, modify these questions to hit those domains. And what we really tried to do is bring out the stories, the candid conversations, the frank and honest team vulnerabilities. Frankly, the burnout, the trauma that people were experiencing, try to bring that out and get that from those teams. And so it's groups of uh, four to 10 members and without their direct reports in the same session. So they, they felt, I think it was a safe place to discuss um, what they were proud of and also where they thought opportunities existed. And we also mentioned as we started each session that the information would be kept confidential and not shared with the other groups, just in case they were worried about that as well. So how did you manage that, Julie, given that you had Amy and her team sitting in? So the direct reports weren't there, but senior leadership was. How did that safe space get, get created? This is um, really a question amazed. for all of you. That, that's a great question and a point, Marty. Um, I was really amazed because the previous gap analysis that I, that I was able to see, Marty, with you and Tim, they're the risk and patient safety and quality teams, they might introduce the group, but then they kind of left and did their own thing and came back between sessions and had their own session. But with Amy's team being present, it was really clear that they were working behind the scenes or something. You could tell something had been going on behind the scenes. And I didn't have all this history when I came in that Amy's just talked about, but they trusted each other. Um, you could tell there was this enormous trust between, gosh, the eight different facilitated groups we had they, they knew Amy and her team already. Like they, they okay. had this relationship. It was hard to describe, but they, um, they just uh, were able to function together and still have open conversations. And, and Marty, if I could clarify a little bit, because a question came up in the Q and A. Yep. So the way it's set up, just like Julie described, is that there was a lot of trust already with Amy and her team in all of these groups. They all trusted her and the team. The key part though is, nobody's boss was in the room. And that is the key to setting up the stakeholder meetings. No one's boss is in the room. And on the confidentiality part, which is in the Q&A, is that the thought was no comment would be ascribed to an individual person. There would always be, it would be more general themes that we were trying to get, telling them we are going to communicate the general comments we're getting back to Amy and the leadership but no individual's name would be listed at all related to any of the sessions we did, Marty. So that, I just wanted to say that now to clarify uh, the, the, qu the question again that was asked um, in the Q&A. Great, thanks, Tim. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so here is the group of people it looks like that you targeted to, to do these sessions with. Um, um, why was this group chosen and um, and again, Julie, you've kind of mentioned this, but there was about four to eight people in a session. Roughly four to 10 members per session. Thank goodness Amy and her team scheduled those ahead of time. People <laughs> just showed up to the room and uh, we started, you know, with introductions and just went through the group. Um, we had the, we had family medicine physicians, CEO, VP of ops. Uh, we had frontline clinical from pharmacy, from nursing, from respiratory therapy, sleep center, imaging. 
volunteers and chaplains, um, and, and they were all in strategically placed groups that was already planned for me just to kind of get through each of those groups uh, with our questions. And we had hospitalists and surgeons and managers and directors too. Great. What about communications? Where did they fit in here? Your communications people? That Are they under managers and directors? You know, the managers and directors group was a very interesting group because they had just come, if I remember correctly, from this meeting with the consultants. And I would ask Amy if there were, if communications was in that group, but they started off they had just literally just come from another meeting about, uh, I think, some recommendations to cut back a little bit. And so they were really fired up in a, in a concentration way. And so it was a little bit uh, of more of a challenge to kind of break through on that group. But I think that's probably where the communications team was. I'll, I'll ask Amy about that. Amy, do you want to jump in? So I, maybe I need some uh, clarification, Marty. Are you looking for how we communicated to these teams or a communications team specifically? I'm wondering if you brought in your communications and marketing people, how you were going to talk about candor, not only internally, but externally. Okay, yes. Uh, we, um, outside of our gap analysis, um, actually we, when we first uh, decided to embark on our candor work, um, we were assigned a project manager who was both project management and marketing. Um, so her job duties were 50-50. And so she has been working with us on this since the beginning, um, which I, I would say is um, extraordinarily important for us. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, okay, good. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. I mean, we're running, a, I'm loving the conversation. Please keep the questions coming into the chat room. Um, um, and um, here, I think we just are trying to get at what you what you learned, or this is sort of more the approach too. Um, Tim, why don't you jump in here? I, I, I see the magic wand here. I've worked with you in the magic wand. Are these some of the questions that you asked and, and what you prior sure. during the events? Sure, Marty. So. We developed this methodology over the years of our, our grant, you know, to do this. Every single session begins with share with us where you get your greatest joy in your job. And then we get into a lot of the domain and the open-ended questions that Julie described about tell us about the culture of the organization. Are you comfortable speaking up when you see unsafe situations? Um, tell us about event reporting and the system for reporting events and how they're responded to. And take us through a case that you may have been involved in, really open-ended, trying to get to all those different domains we talked about. And then every single session we tried to finish with, if you had a magic wand and you could change anything in the organization to bring you more joy, what would that be? And that was the standard methodology, Marty, in all of these sessions. So when we were done, we had hundreds and hundreds of joy comments and magic wand comments to turn around and put together for leadership, Amy, Chihoy, and the others that were there. So, but I'll let Julie talk more about the tears we would see, some of the responses when in this safe space, people felt really comfortable sharing what it is that they, they wanted to share. I was just amazed, Tim, at the things people would share and just, uh, it was emotional sometimes. Uh, I think you know, a few examples of the things people shared for having joy at work was getting patients through a tough time, collaborating with the team, to be in a be with people in a place of peace, telling stories with patients, empowering people, helping others to see the mission and vision, and and they enjoyed lots of fresh energy, statements like that, and just stories that they told, it was really impressive, and I think building um, on that question about joy, what brings you a joy at work started the conversation with the questions we were going to ask came from a place of joyful like that joyful buzz is what got the meeting started and opened it up then you could ask questions about you know how involved are patients and families in the committees that you that you sit in on and what happens when there's unacceptable behavior and what kinds of root cause analysis um, have you been involved in and it, uh, it just opened them up to being more conversational about that 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk so much in this work about head heart connection. And I think, you know, starting with that joy, what brings you joy at work helps, helps, you know, just establish that as this is a place to talk about that. Yep. Um, let's move on to the next slide. I'd like to kind of move forward here. Tim, um, one of the things I wanted you to speak to this, uh, although Amy and Julie, you're welcome to jump in as well, but I know one of the key audiences to get engaged is the medical staff. I know that's often a challenge for organizations. These are actually quotes from, um, from another presentation that you and I have done together with another client about the, the kinds of things we hear from physicians. Do you want to just speak to the importance of the medical staff in this process? Well, as you'll see, in the, even in the lessons learned, Marty, and we're talking about it is, it, one of the keys to success is making sure you have medical staff knowledge and information about the process, but also some buy-in. And you don't need it from everybody to start. You need a few champions. But what we've learned meeting with the medical staffs has been, particularly in COVID-19, how badly they want the care for the caregiver or peer support program and how badly they want help in having these very difficult conversations with patients and families. There's this idea of moral injury that many of us in healthcare suffer when we're not put in a position to be able to share what we know about what has happened with these patients and families. It, we know it leads to physician suicide. We know it leads to nursing suicide. So now more than ever, Marty, that's what we're hearing from them. And if you really want to get your medical staff engaged, it is letting them know that this program has a huge upside for them, as well as the patients and families that we've talked about. Fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you want to copy on this. I mean, I wasn't at your, I wasn't part of your sessions, but I know when I've seen Tim and Julie work elsewhere, there's often just a, sort of a hesitance or, or a reluctance or a lack of trust the medical staff brings to this that you've got to kind of get through. Was that true for you or, or, yes. or not? Okay. <laughs> um, we, you know, we, we knew that there was going to be a barrier um, and, you know, it's, it was great to work with Tim um, early on, and he shared with us some of the learnings from their, the first 200 hospitals, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, before it got published. So we knew what to expect, and we knew that clinicians were going to be um, you know, a challenge to get them to embrace um, this process. So um, we started early on talking to our, our clinician colleagues um, sharing with them what our, our vision is for how we approach patient harm, um, engaging them with Tim um, and uh, having him come talk to them and, and present. Um, we actually um, had a very challenging um, patient um, harm event uh, that, that ended up um, being non-preventable harm, but it was so complex that Tim came on site and helped us um, with this process and, and talking to the family and demonstrated the value of Candor before we had even um, really educated on it. So mm -hmm. trying to demonstrate um, all the way through to our clinician colleagues that we mean this, this is what we value, this is what's in our policy, um, but we want you to engage with us to have planned conversations, um, that, that this is a principled and comprehensive approach. Maybe I'm glad you brought that up because if you think about the timeline, there's gonna be events that happen as you're rolling this out and they become opportunities to sort of walk the talk. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Thanks, Tim, thanks, Amy. Okay. Um, this is really probably what you went in with sort of a structure about what you wanted to get. But the question I want to use this slide to trigger is what did, uh, what did Samaritan learn? You know, if you had to summarize, Amy, I'm going to turn to you first. What did you get out of this um, that was really helpful to you to decide to move forward? Uh, so we, we shared some um, broad strokes, like a, a one pager with our um, management teams at each of our sites specific to their site. Um, and the first thing that we listed and what we learned in our gap analysis is that we're ready. Um, we identified, we absolutely have opportunities. We're still working on some of those opportunities right now, um, but we are ready 
we were ready at the time um, to embark on, on our candor work. Um, we also learned that we are open to having difficult conversations with patients. And it's not that we don't know what to say, but that we don't know how to say it. Um, we needed that, that training on how to be empathic, how to have planned communication um, with our patients and even our colleagues. Um, and we also learned that we need a structured process in how we respond. And we're still working on that um, now as COVID winds down and we're starting to embrace some of our high reliability work, uh, intertwining those. Um, we had lots of strengths, opportunities, and weaknesses um, that I'd, I'd be happy to share um, as well, but those were the main tenants. Amy, can you also say, I mean, how you reported this out to senior management and what their reaction was? Absolutely. We um, worked with Tim uh, because we were involved in a lot of the, um, the all of the sessions of the gap analysis. Um, we were able to provide insights and clarification um, to some of the report out um, language that meant something to us that maybe didn't didn't resonate with Tim. And so we worked with him. I think we had a, a two hour long session of a report out with all of our senior executives uh, across the health system. Um, we did have some findings that were, were specific to certain areas that we felt um, needed further uh, discussion with our executive leadership in a private setting. Um, not necessarily beneficial to the whole, but needed to be addressed. Um, and then we took that information, we, we did a road show, we went to all of our sites and shared um, a, a more meaningful uh, amount of information to our managers, gave them information to then share with their, um, their employees as well. So it was a cascading communication approach, which is our, one of our processes now um, within the health system. And how did you give feedback to, um, to the people who participated? I mean, Julie and Tim and you have told us that there was emotional content that came out and um, some very heartfelt things. What kind of feedback did you give them about how, how their, their investment of time and energy and comments were going to be used? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, Real time, we, we thanked them, you know, obviously during the sessions, followed up with all of them afterwards individually. I, I wish I had, you know, in, in retrospect, a better answer for how we got specific information to them um, regarding our findings. You know, I, I wish uh, looking back, we had taken the time to um, share that one pager of here's what we learned and thank you so much for your time. I could do it again, I would uh, differently, but we did communicate with them afterwards, just our, our level of appreciation, especially for those who were extraordinarily vulnerable. Okay. Well, and, and Marty, if I could add, Amy, the other part that happened that was beautiful was when we came back to do the training, uh, most of the people who came to the training had also been in the facilitated sessions. And so we would always begin every session, Marty, with Amy and Chi Hoi talking about, here's where we were, you know, here's what we found out, and here's where we're going. So it was kind of neat to actually do it almost face-to-face -face in a lot of these trainings. Okay. Um, so, uh, and Sandy did ask a quick question. I can jump on here right now. So we actually, Sandy, in the ARC gap analysis toolkit brought in some of the questions that we do ask on the HRO domain domains, but we modified it even further. So after the ARC toolkit came out, the candor toolkit came out, we added even more questions around those domains. And it's based on that article, Marty, as you know, by Chasen and Loeb, who talked about ways you can actually go into these organizations and see where they are. So we created a bit of a hybrid Sandra, about how you can go about doing that. So that's the quick answer to that question that just got posed. Okay, good. We are going to have some time for Q&A too, so keep the, the questions coming to Tim and Amy and Julie, and we're going to move forward now to come out of the kind of Samaritan experience. Thanks so much, Amy, for sharing as much as you did. It was, I think it's going to be really, really helpful to our attendees. And just, um, I'm going to ask Tim and, and maybe Julie, you start first. Compared to the other, um, 
gap analyses you've done for other organizations. How was Samaritan similar? How was Samaritan different? I mean, what was unique or what did you learn or what, what, what thoughts do you have about how it compared to others? Um, one uh, was the discussion that we, we just, we just already mentioned about Amy and their team coming to the sessions. That was great. Um, there was so much hope in uh, the future with their new leadership at Samaritan. Um, that was a common theme uh, that they couldn't say they knew exactly um, every time the mission and vision and where they were going, but they they trusted their new leadership and they would come right out and say they were super excited about that. Uh, so that was really impressive. Um, some other gap analyses that we've done um, seem to happen kind of right after a big traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the common themes revolved around the, the trauma from that. There were still some mentions of caregivers experiencing trauma in this session as well, but it, uh, it was more of hopeful. It was more of a new leadership hope, something good is coming kind of from this gap analysis. So the the common themes there. And I think too, a lot of the similar themes came out about um, wishing for provider mentorship, that peer support. So I'm really glad to hear that Amy and their team chose to go with that first, if they had to kind of pause on other things that that peer support is something they needed and um, common, but something they needed. And then wanting you know facilities for patients with mental health challenges, chemical impairment, and um, they actually talked too about wanting more time to implement mindfulness resources, which is another theme that we saw in some of the other uh, gap analyses is they, they get a lot of information about being mindful and peer support resources, but they don't have time to actually implement that. So those themes came out too, as, as we had seen before, but I think the hope was the big thing. Yeah, and, and to add Marty, what really, really for me set uh, a lot of the Samaritan sort of work, the whole the whole service, the whole the whole system was just eye opening for me. One of the questions you know we like to ask is around: Are you encountering? Are you recognizing issues related to diversity and inclusion? You know, issues around language preference and gender identity and things like that. And Samaritan was one of the first organizations that was grappling right away and looking for solutions around issues around transgender patients. It was so heartwarming to see an organization so embrace where we need to go in healthcare. It was, it was remarkable for me to be involved in that. And Amy, I don't know if you wanna to speak to that, but you know, I constantly come back to you because of the cutting edge stuff that you do, you know, particularly in this area. It's just amazing. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I, I don't know that I have um, anything specific to say, you know, other than trans rights or human rights, as well as, you know, every, um, every type of person. Um, and, and I, I, you know, we've struggled with um, racism and um, implicit bias, not just uh, with transgender patients, um, uh, you know, we, we have embraced um, demonstrating same-sex relationships as well. Um, we just feel like it's very important for um, our colleagues um, to see representation of themselves um, or of people that are different from them um, and treating them exactly the same as you would want your, your family member or yourself to be treated. Okay. Well, kudos to you, Amy, for being in the forefront of such a positive approach. Okay, we are um, we are now kind of uh, closing in on time. And Tim, uh, the article I just showed, Doc, can we go back to the last slide just quickly? This is an article Tim and I wrote with a number of other colleagues a couple of years ago after lessons learned from 200 hospitals. There's uh, clearly more now, including the Samaritan group. But Tim, I'm gonna just show the, the quick findings here. You've already mentioned, um, next slide please, Donna. 
some of the things that we found were really important in those first 200 hospitals that really were that you had, you had done. And I highlighted the importance of C-suite engagement and bo uh, board of directors support here, um, because you know I know from reading writing this article with you that you know organizations fail if they don't take that into attention. You've also mentioned diversity. Is there anything else here that you would like to really emphasize as crucial to the gap analysis? Um, well, I, I, the other part is, as you can see there, and, and even Julie brought this up as well, is that it really is important to get a sense of how much you're getting patient and family involvement in the review of the events and the process improvement part. That's another part where we see uh, it being absolutely critical. The other thing I'd like to say to this that's also critical, and Amy, I'd like to have you comment on, is going to be, we got a question in the, in the Q&A about uh, could you get a little more specific about your engagement? Because this is one of the lessons learned is you need your liability carriers on board. Can you speak a little bit more about your broker and then the carrier and how you actually are insured? Because uh, it's a great question that comes up a lot. It is a great question. Um, and thanks for asking. because it's, it's one that I think provides a lot of context. We are self-insured. So we have a, a captive. We work. Um, with Gallagher. Um, so John Walpole, I don't know that he's on, but he's the one that connected us to Tim. Uh, so thank you, John. Um, we, we got connected um, to Tim through John, and then we had a few, um, a few cases where it was difficult for our defense counsel to wrap their brains around what we wanted to do. Um, we had two that I can think of off the top of my head, but I think there's more um, events where we had a, a really delayed disclosure. Um, and, I, and I used disclosure intentionally because we told them stuff that they didn't know. Um, and some of them we needed our reinsurers on board for. Um, and so it took us, I, I not overestimating probably um, 50 to 100 man hours to plan for some of these conversations um, with our broker, our defense counsel, our um, reinsurers, Tim engaged with us um, to make sure that we we're doing it truly in a principled fashion, um, but ultimately with the patient and their family um, and our, our team members uh, at the heart of it. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Amy, is that as this gap analysis process was going on, you were also having conversations kind of spinning out of the issues that were coming out of it that you needed to do to kind of get your audiences on board. Did you bring in your external counsel into the gap analysis process formally? You know, I don't know that we did. Um, now that I think about it, and I think that would be a, a great idea. We prepped them. We had a lot of conversations with them. We invited them to our training mm -hmm. um, sessions as well. Um, connected, you know, with Tim in this the process pretty early on. Um, and again, you know, we had this long still are in the, the long timeline of, of our implementation. And so as we had cases come up uh, that warranted um, honest conversations with patients, um, we were able to, to really um, learn the candor process um, with Tim. I mean, it was, it was a one and then one and then one. Um, I, I grew a lot in the last <laughs> few years in our um, learning and understanding of candor. Okay. Yeah, well, and Julie, you can probably speak a little bit to, we are improving our engagement with attorneys. I mean, your group as well that you're involved in. This is a really critical question, Marty. Julie, do you want to comment on that as well with you and some of your colleagues I've spoken to? I agree. I think um, the big the big learning we've had, in, uh, and I'm part of a, a partner in a law firm, and we, <clears throat> we met with Tim and we met with John Walpole and uh, Marty, you might be next if you're willing, but we just want to learn maybe more about what individuals want to know. And so we've been planning and working through um, some educational sessions. And so learning more about that and how the process works and what people want to know about. So for us, it's just um, 
learning from these experiences about, you know, what kind of questions come up and what would people want to know more about. So that's what we're working on. Fantastic. One other thing I wanted to mention, um, which is really important. So we are self-insured, but we have a lot of clinicians that work at our health system that are insured mm -hmm. by um, private insurance companies. And that has been hard for us. Yes. Um, that is a, a, a real challenge and, and barrier when we look at resolving um, patient harm early and we want to do the candor process and the insurance company of, of the co-defendant, uh, if you will, is not on that same page. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations with our executive leadership team um, and our, our attorneys and insurance brokers about that process. And it's usually each individual case. I know that's been an issue before. And um, maybe in our next candor um, webinar, we should talk, Tim, about how to bring the insurers together in some kind of a discussion to help them get on the same page. Yeah. And in the, in the Q&A, Marty, Kendra just brought up a phenomenal point on that. So let me just share now. And Marty, I just talked to you about this earlier this morning. And I want to bring Amy into that group that we've talked about. But we have a group that's called the Partners in Communication. We now, Amy, have 18 carriers for the independent providers who have joined this group to talk about how do we, when harm occurs, collaborate together where the self-insured organization is able to communicate and collaborate with the providers of the independent, you know, non-employed docs or other people there. And we've made a ton of progress. We actually have now a written agreement we've created that we're trying to get people to sign on with. I'd love you to be part of that, Amy. And Kendra, that's how we're going to go here. And we do even have in Colorado, we have some members of Copic and others, Marty, who have joined and been part of this group. So really exciting. I think we need to think about the next webinar or even one after that to get to this because Amy has just articulated one of the most critical things that needs to happen going forward in organizations. Spot on. And, and Julie, you probably agree as well yeah. with your law firm on that. So. Julie, Tim, Amy, we are closing in the time at the end of our time today. So uh, thanks so much. Um, Donna, let's just quickly to the next slide. There's a bunch of research and tools that we um, have assembled for you. These don't all go to gap analysis. They go to just the ROI in general, but they could be important to get leadership on board. So we've got um, examples of this. We also have a, an example of a gap analysis that's been de-identified. That, um, that Tim shared with us. Uh, if you'd like to see that, just check out the resources. Um, and thank you for all the questions that we've got. Donna, we, we wanna do one last poll here in our last couple of minutes. Um, so, so again, you know, bring up your Slido. How useful was this discussion in helping you understand the candor gap analysis? I learned what I wanted to know was one choice. I still have questions. Um, I'd like to see more events about candor. Okay, we have a nice group there, still answers coming in, still have questions. I'm not surprised by that. I mean, we've, yeah. sessions like this raise questions because this is hard work. I mean, as you know, part of the timeline issue you have, Amy, is just, the, you know, it's, it's hard to get people on the same page, especially for something that's as dramatic a shift in kind of the traditional approach to risk that this represents. Yeah, I, I very much like high reliability, this is, a marathon, um, maybe more like an Ironman. Um, <laughs> it, it takes it takes dedication and commitment, and, and that's one of the learnings in, in um, the article that you highlighted is truly not understanding how much work this takes um, is one of one of the missteps a lot of organizations take. And I would say I didn't realize how much it was going to take. Um, and, and feel very fortunate that our, our executive leadership all the way up to Doug have prioritized um, this as, as uh, something for our health system. Yeah. Amy, if you could, there's still one question I didn't quite bring up to you. If you can just share a little bit, how are you now really beginning to engage patients and families and loved ones in event reviews or getting their perspective on what has happened? That was one question that was, again, buried in the Q&A, if you could, you could jump on that. Very quickly. 
very quickly. Um, we we aren't doing it consistently um, because we don't have a consistent root cause analysis process that's coming. Um, that's part of our, our high reliability work. So in the next few months, um, we will have that consistent process across the system. Um, I have engaged uh, families in the conversation. I can think of one in particular um, where we would not have learned all of the information we needed uh, to be able to identify what exactly happened to this patient. And when we went back and, and did a full review in, uh, in January for our high reliability work, we found 19 opportunities um, that would have prevented this patient's death. Um, and awesome. we would not have learned all of those opportunities, um, holes in the Swiss cheese, if you will, if we hadn't have talked with the family and engaged with them. Um, and we did embrace the candor process with them um, and their attorney. Um, one of uh, their attorney is, is somebody that we've partnered with on a couple of candor cases. Um, and and I, I think he's going to be a, a strong advocate for the process moving forward. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, I will just say, and we'll respond more um, in email that there are um, where organizations have a PFAC structure. They've they've engaged them in the in the gap analysis process and learned a lot too. Um, Donna, over to you. We're right at time, I know, but you have some uh, some uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much, Marty. What a fabulous moderator you are. And thank you, Amy, Julie, and Tim. This has been such a great session. As you saw in the Slido poll that we just did, there's still lots of questions. So please, everybody do come back for part three that will be next month. Um, I'm sure we will continue to identify more learning needs that we will, we will definitely work on uh, you know, creating new sessions to meet. Any questions that we did not answer during this session, we will, um, we will be posting that along with uh, all of the other links that I, post, I put in the chat that will be on our YouTube page. So, um, so we'll get the panelists to answer some of those questions in writing uh, and have that posted um, as soon as we can. Um, again, just very quickly, if you are interested in getting CE for this, for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians, you will receive an email from MedStar Health um, and you'll need to complete the evaluation in order to get that. For ACHE, please log your information into your account. For CPPS and BCPA, you'll receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation within the next five to seven days. And for CPHQ, uh, NAHQ will take care of, of uh, documenting your attendance here today. So again, thank you everybody for joining. This is such a fabulous topic and such a fabulous panel. And we really appreciate having you all here today. Julie, thank Tim, you, um, thank you, thank you to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Thank you so much. And Amy, thank you so much for sharing your organization's experience. I mean, it, it will be really helpful uh, to others. And Julie, your expertise was just great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.